The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the first epistle of Peter, the first chapter, reading this evening from verse 18 to verse 23. The first chapter in the first epistle of Peter, reading from verses from verse 18 to verse 23. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and to unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now I want in particular to deal with that last verse I've just read, the 23rd verse. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Those who attend here regularly will know that... um, On the previous uh, six Sunday evenings, we've been looking at this uh, great section of Scripture in this first uh, chapter of the first epistle of Peter, from verse 13 to the end, perhaps from verse 10 to the end. And we've been doing so because it presents us with such a magnificent statement of the cardinal elements, the foundation truths of the Christian faith. Now, we have seen that this is a great truth Uh, which necessitates our girding up the lines of our mind. It's such a magnificent thing, so vast. And we've looked at the picture given here of its grandeur, this great movement of God, which was ordained, as we've been reminded here, before the foundation of the world, but was actually manifest, put into operation, when the Lord Jesus Christ was born as a baby in Bethlehem and lived in this world, was crucified and died and buried and rose again and ascended up into heaven and the Holy Spirit was sent down. That's how it was manifested, but it was foreordained before the world. But why should we listen to it, says somebody? Why should I bother to gird up the lines of my mind to consider such a statement, such a gospel? And now we've been considering the answers to that question. One thing is because... It delivers us from the kind of life which we all live by nature, what he calls your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers. We have seen also that it delivers us out of a very dangerous position in which we are. We are all in the hands of God, and we are face to face with a God before whom we shall have to stand in judgment when we come to die, and who we are told will judge us without respect of persons according to our works. It tells us that there is a day coming when the Son of God will come back into this world to judge it in righteousness. And we will all have to appear before him. That's another reason it's given us. And then it has gone on to tell us various other things. Namely, that in view of all this, our greatest need patently is to know God. Rarely to know him as Father so that we can call upon him and be blessed by him. And then that brought us last Sunday night to this, that there is only one way in which we can ever come to that knowledge, and that is in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, and specifically through his sacrificial atoning death. Knowing, he says, that you were redeemed from your vain conversation received by tradition from your father, not with corruptible things as silver and gold, 
but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's it. That was our theme last Sunday night. There is only one way whereby men can ever know God, and that is in and through Jesus Christ, by the blood of Christ. No man has ever truly known God except in this way. People can talk about God. They can express their opinions, give their ideas. I'm talking about knowing God. Knowing him as your father. Knowing that you're a child of God. There's only one way in which that can happen. And that is the way that God himself has provided. Jesus Christ, his son, is his lamb. The lamb of God. That taketh away the sin of the whole world. He's a lamb without blemish and without spot. Delivered up for us. That he might redeem us. Very well. Now then, that is the point at which we have arrived, and therefore we go on to another point, which is this. What then does the gospel offer us in this way? Here is its great announcement. That because the Son of God came into this world and bore our sins and their punishment, certain things are open to us, certain things are possible to us. What are they? Well, now then, let us answer that question this evening. The apostle says that in this way we are redeemed. What does he mean by this? Well, we were considering uh, some of the aspects last Sunday night of our bondage. We are like people in prison. We are like people who are taken prisoners and are held captive. And we need to be redeemed. We can't escape. We need to be redeemed. We can be redeemed. And that's the way in which we are redeemed. But very well, the question tonight is, what does it mean? What do you mean, says someone, by being redeemed? Peter says to these people uh, that they know that. For as much as you know that uh, you were not redeemed with corruptible things, you have been redeemed. But what does it mean? Well, now then, this means two main things. To be redeemed in the first place means that we are reconciled to God. That we are delivered out of the position in which we were at enmity against God and we're not being blessed by God. That, I say, is the fundamental uh, trouble with mankind. The world is as it is because it's not enjoying the blessing of God. When God blesses, there is peace, there is happiness, there is joy. There's no turmoil, there's no trouble when God blesses. When God made the world, he made it perfect, called it paradise. And there was no trouble there at all. God was blessing it abundantly, pouring his blessing upon it. Ah, yes, but sin came in, men rebelled. And the whole position was changed immediately. Man was in trouble and in distress. Pain and sorrow came in. And men, you see, now had to go on living outside the smile of God and without the blessing of God. To be redeemed, I say, means first and foremost that a man is reconciled to God, restored to a knowledge of God, restored to the favor of God. It means this, that we are no longer under the condemnation of God's law and no longer under the wrath of God. That was our position as we've seen. We've broken God's law and the law makes it quite plain that the punishment for transgression is death. Banishment out of the sight of God. Excluded from the blessing of God. Well, that's where we were. We are all born under the condemnation of the law. I mustn't keep you with this this evening. The Apostle Paul, if you want to read the demonstration of that, you've simply got to read the first three chapters of Paul's epistle to the Romans. And there you will find that he can sum it up like this. That there is none righteous, no, not one. He says, the whole world lieth guilty before God. He repeats, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that's the position of every one of us by nature. What does to be redeemed mean? Oh, that we are taken out of that position. The law condemns us. But there is a way which has been provided by the death of the Son of God. 
whereby we can be delivered from the condemnation of the law. And so God's wrath is no longer upon us. Oh, I know that I'm talking about things that sound strange to the modern ear and that the modern palate dislikes. People say, do you talk about the wrath of God? I thought God was a God of love. Well, my dear friend, you may think that and you may think many other things. I've thought them myself. But you know, our business is not to put up our thoughts for which there is no sanction at all, except that we say and that other people like ourselves say the same thing. What God has said is that his wrath is upon all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men that hold down the truth in unrighteousness. You may say you don't agree with it. All right. All I would remind you of is that you're disagreeing with God and that you're in the hands of God. God being God, holy and just and everlasting light and purity can have no dealings with sin. And all who have sinned are under the wrath of God and under the condemnation of his holy law. But thank God. God himself has provided the way of redemption and of our release in his own Son as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The Son of God was led as a lamb to the slaughter for our sins. He was bruised for our transgressions. The way, I say, has been made open. To be redeemed means to be restored to the favor of God, which means that God forgives us. God pardons us. Let me use an Old Testament expression which is so wonderful. He blots out our transgressions like a thick cloud. Let me give you another. He casts them into the sea of his own forgetfulness. What a wonderful statement. That's the first meaning of redemption. That God, I say, freely forgives our sins because his Son has borne their punishment if we believe in him. Now, this means that we're in an entirely new relationship to God. God now begins to smile upon us and to bless us in a new way. In his infinite kindness, he did bless us in a sense, even before we were reconciled to him. He causeth his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth his reign on the just and the unjust. There are thousands of blasphemers in the world tonight who are being blessed by God. They don't know it. If God withheld the sun and the rain, they'd all die. It's God who is blessing them in spite of their unworthiness. Ah, but I'm talking about a new way of blessing. We come into an entirely new relationship to God. We become his children. God is our Father. He now looks upon us and smiles upon us. The sin that was between us is gone. Christ has taken it away. We are freely forgiven. Everything forgotten. And God looks upon us as if we'd never sinned at all. That is the first meaning of redemption. We have been redeemed from the curse of the law, from the condemnation of the law, from the wrath of God, from this retribution that would certainly come upon us and which we so richly deserve. That's the first meaning of redemption. We are reconciled to God. We were at enmity before, but now we have been reconciled, a friendship, a new relationship, father, child, child, father, a new relationship has come into being. That's the first thing. But let me hurry this evening particularly to the second thing, which is this. We are also set free, says the apostle, from the old kind of life which we formerly lived. Listen to him saying it. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from, out of, your vain conversation, which means habit or way of life, received by tradition from your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 
Now then, here is the second aspect of redemption. We are delivered, I say, from that old kind of life which we were living. Now, I needn't keep you about that because we spent an evening looking at that. That old evil life. Peter describes it like this. He says, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts in your ignorance. Vain conversation. Useless. A bubble. Mere appearance. Nothing in it. Useless. Doesn't lead to anything. Now then, here we are told that there is the possibility of being redeemed out of the tyranny of that old life. And this is another wonderful thing which the gospel offers to us. We all, I take it, realize something of the tyranny of this old life. It's the way of the world. The way of the world and the flesh and the devil. It's the thing that holds us in bondage. We all know it. The thing that keeps on getting us down. We hate it at times and we don't want to do it and yet we go back and do it. That's what, he, that's what he's talking about. Everybody born into the world conforms to the worldly way of living. Everybody. There's no exception. Oh, but you say, isn't there a difference between good and bad people? It's just a relative goodness, that's all. It's not a real difference. Merely a partial one, merely a relative difference. In the sight of God, there is no difference at all. You may say that there's a difference between being at sea level and being on the top of a little hill which is a hundred feet above sea level. I quite agree, but you know, if you put those differences in the light of Mount Everest, well, I don't think you'd be troubled to talk about it at all, would you? Then if you could even add to that and multiply by infinity, you'd arrive at God. And that's the difference between the so-called good men and the so-called bad men. May I use an illustration which I sometimes use, which I think puts it very well? It isn't the symptoms of a disease that matter. What really matters is that a man is diseased. You can walk into a hospital ward and see a man in a raving delirium. Ah, oh, you say the man's desperately ill. But there may be a man lying in the next bed to him who's absolutely quiet, doesn't move at all. What's the matter with him? Well, there may be some cancerous growth that is just eating out his vitals and killing him. What's it matter that one man is violent in his symptoms and that the other man is lethargic and doesn't give the appearance of any symptoms at all? The point is that the two men are ill and that the second disease is worse even than the first. How foolish we are to talk about good and bad. In the sight of God there is none righteous, no, not one. We are all in the thraldom of this vain conversation, this evil life that is being lived by the world. Now then, says this man, what the gospel brings to you is this, it tells you that because the Son of God came into this world and bore your sins in his own body on the tree, you can not only be delivered from the condemnation of the law, you can be set free from your vain conversation delivered to you by tradition from your fathers. You can be set free from the thraldom and the tyranny of this evil worldly life and be enabled to live an entirely new kind of life. How is there some? No, then that's the question. How? How does that happen? Here is the answer. That's why I'm emphasizing verse 23, particularly this evening. Listen. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Listen. Being born again, or a better translation is this, having been begotten again. What a tremendous statement. What's it mean? Now, this is to me one of the most important things for people to grasp because I so often talk to people about these matters and I find that their whole notion of Christianity is something like this. Ah, they say, Christianity is that which tells you that God forgives you. And they say, as far as it goes, that's all right. But you know, says the man, I want something more than that. I'm still left to live in this world and it's a difficult place to live in. 
I find sin peering at me out of every newspaper and round every corner and on the hoardings and everywhere. Is your gospel just something that tells me that I'm going to be forgiven at the end and am I left in this world to struggle and sweat and fight and try to live a good and a clean and a moral life? I can't do it. But there are many people who think of Christianity like this as if it were just a message that announces forgiveness and perhaps the Lord Jesus Christ as an example that he came to tell us how to live and lived it before us and now in the light of his example we're going to rise up and do it. Thank God that isn't Christianity. If that were Christianity, well then I say it would make me feel completely and entirely and utterly hopeless. But that's a fatal misunderstanding of Christianity. What is Christianity? Here is a central truth. Not only am I forgiven, I am born again. The gospel not only offers a man forgiveness, it offers him a new birth. Now, let me show you that this is not merely something that is taught here by the Apostle Peter, but is a central part of the whole of the New Testament teaching. Take this passage which we read at the beginning in the Gospel according to St. John. It's everywhere in the Gospel according to St. John. Listen to this in the first chapter. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God to them who believe on his name. That's it. Then did you notice what our Lord said to Nicodemus, that great master and teacher in Israel? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man, he says, be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Same thing. You get it in the next chapter of John's Gospel, where our Lord is speaking to the woman of Samaria. You remember the conversation about the well and about how to get water out of that well? And our Lord looked at the woman and said, that whosoever taketh of this water, the water of the well, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Same thing. A new life. A new birth. A new beginning. Take it again in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. I am come, says our blessed Lord, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Life. Not just forgiveness, and then leaving us to live and struggle and fail in our own strength, but life. Listen to the Apostle Paul saying it. I'm only choosing certain obvious examples at random. If any man be in Christ Jesus, says Paul, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. New creature. New creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A new man in a new world. The Apostle James, in his epistle which comes before this one, he says exactly the same thing. Listen to him putting it like this. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He begat us by his word. Here it is in our text this evening. Go to the second epistle of Peter and you'll find him saying this, that we, he says, have become partakers of the divine nature whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Virtually what he's saying in our text tonight. And if you go on to the first epistle of John, you will find exactly the same thing. Listen to him putting it like this. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, 
for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now then, there you see is abundant evidence to prove that this is a central New Testament teaching. What's it mean? Being born again. What does this mean? Well, we can safely say this about it, can't we? It is a definite event in one's life. Peter uses here the perfect tense. Having been born again, having been begotten again, he uses what is called the perfect tense. What is the perfect tense? Well, the perfect tense in Greek is this. It is the tense that is used when a writer wants to describe something that has happened once and its effects are continuing. It happened and it's continuing in its effects and consequences. That is the meaning of the perfect tense. That's the very tense that the apostle used here. So I deduce from that that to be born again means that an event takes place in one's life. And Peter, of course, he is saying to these people, he is reminding them of the fact that that event had taken place in their lives and in their experience. Now, says Peter, I am writing to you like this and exhorting you to love the brethren because you have been born again. There was a time when you were in the world and living that vain conversation. You're no longer doing that. Why? Well, you've been born again. An event has taken place. Something's happened. Now, this is Christianity, you see. Christianity, you know, is not just reading the Christian ethic and then deciding that you're going to try and put it into practice and you keep on and on and hoping that someday you'll become a Christian as you go to church and live a good life and sing hymns. That's not Christianity. What is it then? Well, what makes a man a Christian? I'll tell you. What makes a man a Christian is this, that something happens to him. An event takes place in his life. He's no longer what he was. It took place, its effects continue. Having been, having been born again, Let's be clear about a point that often trips people. This does not mean, you know, that of necessity you can put your finger on a particular moment or a particular text. I'm not saying that. I'm not considering or discussing with you because the Bible doesn't exactly as to how a man is born again. There are many variations there. The Bible is using, you see, a human illustration and analogy. To become a Christian is like being born like a baby being born. Well, now, what matters, you know, is not exactly how the babe was born. What matters is that the babe has been born. Sometimes the labor may be a very long and prolonged and painful one. Sometimes it happens suddenly. You read in the papers, don't you? A baby born in an aeroplane, a baby born on the way to the hospital. Then you hear of other cases where there's been labor for days. What's it matter? What matters is that a baby has been born, a child is born. Whether it took a long time or a little time, it doesn't matter. What the Bible is interested in is not the mode or method, not the particular technique, but that life has come, that there is new life, born again. It is an event. It doesn't matter how exactly it took place, but it must have taken place. There has been a birth. That's the first deduction which we make, but let me go on to a second. This event which has taken place in this life is a very profound one. It has led to a complete change. You see, it is so profound and such a complete change that our Lord himself and the apostles and all the writers feel that there is nothing adequate as an analogy to describe it save that of a birth or a creation. It isn't an improvement. It isn't that you lop off a few sins there and take on a few good works here, or that you put a little varnish on the paint that was already in existence and make it look a little brighter or wash it down and it looks a little brighter for a while. That's not Christianity. Christianity is this vital, transforming, renewal, regeneration. That's the term. A new creature, a new creation, a new birth. It's a complete change. That's what Peter's saying to these people. There you were, you were living that old life, vain conversation, 
received by tradition from your fathers, but you're no longer doing that. You've been born again. You're in a new position. You're new people. My dear friends, this is Christianity. I'm not here, you know, to defend a formal Christianity, which isn't true. I'm not interested in it. There are far too many people like that in the churches, and they're keeping many others out. Because those who are out say, if that's Christianity, I'm not interested. I have a great sympathy with many of them. This is Christianity. New birth. Regeneration. New creation. Well, how does it happen? Well, fortunately, we are told. It obviously isn't something that we do. Nobody gives birth to himself because nobody can. And you see how careful these writers are. What a proof of divine inspiration. Peter not only uses the perfect tense, he uses the passive voice. He says, having been begotten again. It's something that happens to us. We don't do it. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Can a man suddenly say, now I'm going to decide to be a new man? Well, I know we in our folly, we do say things like that, all of us. People will be doing it when the new year comes along. New year's resolutions, I'm going to be a new man. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to start with a clean page. How long does it last, you think? No, no, there's no newness there. What has been will be. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There is nothing new under the sun. What has been will be. And a man can do his utmost to give himself a new beginning. He can't do it. The very term rebirth, being born again, ought to be enough in and of itself. But here it is in the passive tense. Having been begotten again. It's happened to us. Who does it? Who is the agent? There's only one answer. It is God. It's a new creation. And nobody can create but God. For creation means to bring something out of nothing. Man can't do that. Man can modify, remold, reshape, do this and that, but that's not a new creation. Creation is bringing something to being out of nothing. It takes a God to do it. it God alone can do it. And thank God it's what God does. This is the peculiar work and operation of the Holy Spirit. Did you notice how our Lord put it there to Nicodemus? He uses the general phrase, except a man be born again. Nicodemus doesn't get it. So then our Lord says to him, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Born from above. Born of the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit. It is, as I say, a new creation. You remember how we read at the beginning of Genesis that the Spirit brooded over the face of the deep. Over that chaos, the Spirit was brooding over it. And it was He who was the instrument used by the Son and by the Father in bringing the form and the order out of the chaos. What's it mean, says someone? Oh, I'll tell you what it means. What always leads to a birth is the implanting of a seed of life. You can't have a birth unless previously a seed of life had been implanted. It's all in that seed. The power, the life, the everything. It's in the seed. And the seed has been implanted. And out of it comes life. And that is what the Holy Spirit does. This is what makes a man a Christian. It isn't, I say, merely that he's forgiven and he's trying to be better and deciding to be better. No, no. A new principle of life is put into him. A new seed is put into him. A new disposition is put into him. And therefore, he is really a new man. He's not what he was before. A new seed and principle of life. This new disposition is in the man and it's manifesting itself. So he's a new man. He's been born again. But come, I can explain it in detail in this way. If that is what happens to us as we are made Christians by God the Holy Spirit, what is the nature of the change in us? Well, listen to what Peter says. Being born again, then his usual negative, not of corruptible seed. 
You remember he said the same thing about our redemption. He says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. No, no. You know, nothing in the Christian life is corruptible. We couldn't be redeemed. We couldn't be forgiven by anything corruptible. It had to be the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And likewise, I can't be delivered out of my vain conversation by anything corruptible. I must have an incorruptible seed. What he's saying, you see, in other words, is this, that the change that takes place in a man is so great and is so absolutely new that the man is now entirely different. What were we by nature? Well, what we all are by nature, of course, is we are children of a corruptible seed. Every one of us. Do you remember how we are given this truth at the beginning of John's Gospel? Let me quote again John 12 and 13 in the first chapter. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him gave he authority or power to become sons of God. Listen. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. Here is the new man. Here is the man who is born again. Here is the Christian. What is he born of? Not of blood. It isn't by natural generation. Nor of the will of the flesh. It's not the result of lust. Lust gives birth to many children in this world, doesn't it? Blood gives. This natural human relationship does. And nor of the will of men. A man anxious to have a son and a successor to whom he may leave his great name and his great possessions. The will of man. That isn't how a man becomes a Christian. No human will can produce a Christian. It's not a natural birth. But we all, of course, in our first birth into this world come in that way. And we are all born of a corruptible seed. We are all, you know, the children of Adam. We are all the descendants of Adam. And that is why David could say in the 51st Psalm, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Oh, but you say, I don't like that. I don't think it's fair. My dear friend, it doesn't matter what you and I think. Do you recognize this fact that every one of us born into this world is born sinful? Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. The first thing a child does is to do something it's told not to do. It's a born sinner. It's a born rebel. It takes peculiar pleasure in doing things that are prohibited. Why? Well, because it's conceived in iniquity and in sin. Adam has transmitted his sin to the whole of his posterity. We are all born sinners. We are all born with a bias towards sin and evil. There is a seed of corruption in us, every one. That is why, you see, you look at the story of natural men and you see that they gradually become blunted and lose something and become cynical. Most natural men are better when they're young than when they're old. We all tend to go down. We all tend to float down the stream. There is a bias toward evil in every single one of us. Why? Well, because, as our Lord said to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. The nature I've inherited from my parents is a sinful nature. They were sinners before I was conceived, and they transmitted it to me, and it's true of every one of us. We are all born in sin, shapen in iniquity. And the seed that is in us by nature is a corruptible seed. God knows it is. Where does lust come from? Where does desire come from? Why should we prefer evil to good? This is the condemnation, says John 3, 19, that light is come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Why don't men believe in the Son of God? They love evil. That's why. But why do they love evil? Because their natures are evil. The nature comes out in the desire and in the behavior. But you say, what a pessimistic view of life. My dear friend, this is not pessimism, this is realism. 
I'm giving you the explanation, you see, of why the things are taking place that you're reading of in your newspapers. Why everybody's getting so alarmed about the problem of morality in this country. And why they're having to build bigger prisons. And why they don't quite know what to do. Theft, robbery, vice, lust, passion, and all the foulness of modern life. I'm simply telling you why it is. It's because the seed of which we are all born by nature is a corruptible seed. And it leads to lust and passion and selfishness and ugliness and foulness and jealousy and envy and hatred and malice and all the things that the Apostle Paul describes in Galatians chapter 5 as the works of the flesh. And it all leads to decay. It is a corruptible seed. All flesh is as grass and all the glory of men as the flower of grass. There's nothing clean. Your highest flights of heroism are unclean. There's an element of selfishness in them. And all the world's great men have got feet of clay. You get to know all the details about their life. It's all as grass. And all the glory of men as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. And isn't it true? We are living in a terrible age, but you know there's something good even about this. I'm rather glad, you know, that we are getting at last the full details of the lives of some of the so-called great Victorians. I'm not a follower of Lytton Strachey. Don't misunderstand me. But I think there was a lot of false hero worship. Their diaries are coming out, and we're beginning to know the truth about them. They were whited sepulchres. But now the truth comes out. And it's just as well that it should. It may someday convince a foolish, superficial thinking world that the seed of which we are all born by nature is a corruptible seed and leads to nothing but corruption. Your best, your greatest men have this principle of corruption within them. It isn't that, says Peter. Born again, oh, not of corruptible seed this time, but of incorruptible, by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. What's he mean? He means this. Born of God. Born of water and of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. What am I as a Christian? I, says Peter, am a partaker of the divine nature. He that is born of God sinneth not, because his seed remaineth in him. What is this seed? Well, I say it, it sounds daring, but it's in the Bible. This is to be a partaker of the divine nature. What is a Christian? A Christian is a man who has been born again and made anew after the pattern and the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is this new nature? Well, Paul describes it to the Ephesians in these words. Put on the new man, he says, which after God is created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. What a difference. No corruption here. This is of God. This is clean. This is pure. This is without corruption. It is to be born of the Spirit. And the kind of fruit that the seed of the Spirit leads to is this. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, temperance. That's the fruit of the Spirit. An absolute contrast with the works of the flesh. What are they? Adultery, fornication, drunkenness, murders, lasciviousness, envy, jealousy. There are the works of the flesh, corruptible, fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness and goodness and faithfulness and temperance and discipline. My friend, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. We are formed and fashioned after the image of God's dear Son. That's what makes a man a Christian. You are not left as you were. 
and just told that you're forgiven and exhorted to live a better life. That's not Christianity. This is Christianity. That God the Creator takes hold of you, smashes you, then makes you anew, puts a new principle of life into you, puts something of the divine nature into you, gives something to you of Christ's being, makes a new man of you. You're born again, a new creature and a new creation in a new world. And what does that lead to? Well, obviously, you've got a new outlook. You've got a different view of God. You've got a different view of yourself. You've got a different view of your fellow men. You've got a different view of life. You've got a different view of death. You've got a different view of the world. A different view of everything. You can't have new life without having a new outlook. You're a new man. So your philosophy of life is different. And likewise you have new desires. The desires of the natural men are for self, lust, gratification of self, not always physical lust, lust of the mind, anxious to get on, anxious to beat his rival in the profession, anxious to make more money than his brother, anxious to have a better house than the man next door, anxious for a better car, better this, better that, lust, corruptible. That's not the desire of this new man. What are the desires of this man? Here it is, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. He wants to be rid of all that. He wants to be clean. He wants to be pure. He says with David, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He'd sacrifice everything if only he could stop sinning. He wants to be like the saints. He wants to be like Christ. He wants to be worthy of the name of a child of God. That's what he longs for. That's what he thirsts for. That's what he desires with the whole of his being. To be clean, to be righteous, to be just and holy and pure. He has new desires. He is altogether different from what he once was. And thank God he's got new power also. He had no power before. He was the slave of sin The slave of the world, the slave of the devil, the slave of his baser self. But he's got new power. He's got a new ability. He's not alone. There is new life in him. Christ is in him. The Spirit is in him. So that he can stand and resist the devil. And the devil flees from him. Not always, but he can do it. He could never do it before. When he relies on this power, he's never defeated. He prays and says, I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Why? Well, temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. He's not alone. He's got a new power. He's a new man, you see. New in mind. New in emotions. New in will. New in strength. New in power. He's a saint. He's a separated man. He's no longer what he was. That's it. Having been born, having been begotten again. Did you realize that that was Christianity? Is there somebody I wonder in this congregation saying that's a fairy tale? Things like that don't happen in this world. A man has to get on by the sweat of his brow and by his own effort. Is there somebody saying with Nicodemus, how can these things be? Is there somebody saying, yes, that's very wonderful, you know, but it's too good to be true. Can such a thing happen? And I answer you in the words of our Lord himself. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Don't marvel at it. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, nor whither it goeth. So, like that, is every one that is born of the Spirit. You can't understand it. Of course you can't. Who does? I don't. I don't understand it. I'm not here to say that I understand it. I'm here to say it's a fact. 
I don't understand the operations of God. They're not only mysterious, they're marvelous, they're miraculous, they're supernatural, they are divine. I don't understand the incarnation. I don't understand the person of Christ with two natures in the one person. I don't understand it, I say with Paul, great is the mystery of godliness. I'm not here to understand it. I'm here to say it happens. Thank God we are not saved by our understandings. If so, nobody would be saved. If so, some would have a great advantage over others, and nobody would ever be saved who was ignorant and illiterate, and there'd be no hope in sending foreign missionaries out to places where people are illiterate. But thank God that's not Christianity. People think it is, but it isn't. You don't make yourself a Christian by understanding and applying. God makes you a Christian by putting new life into you. It's a rebirth. It's the implantation of the seed of the life of God. The life of God in the souls of men. It's his action. Don't try to understand it. Marvel not. You can't understand the wind. You see its effects, but you don't understand how it happens. You don't see where it comes from. You don't see where it's going. You don't see the wind at all. But does that mean that you're fool enough to decide that the wind hasn't blown something off the tree or blown down a tree? Are you foolish enough to say, well now, I don't believe that that tree's fallen because I haven't seen the wind. Fool! Are you trying to understand the mystery of godliness, the miraculous, the divine, and the supernatural? This I say, I preach unto you. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. It's God's action. The action of the almighty creator putting into you something that wasn't there before. Giving you new life. Making you a new man, a new woman. So much so that you feel, was I ever like that? Was the world ever wonderful to me? I can't see it now. I hate it. It's such a change that you can scarcely believe it's possible. God, because his son came into the world and died on Calvary's cross, is not only offering to pardon your sins freely this minute, but is offering to give you this new life. This new birth. This regeneration to create you anew and to make of you a new being in Christ Jesus. Don't try to understand it. But simply submit to it. As you submit to the effects and workings of the wind. Bend before it. Abandon yourself to it. Say, oh God, though I don't understand it, do it to me. Give me this new life. You ask him that genuinely and believing. And you'll find you've got it. And then you'll say of yourself, having been begotten anew by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.